From KUNC and the NPR Network, this is In the NOCO. I'm Erin O'Toole. Wildfires, like the ones that hit Colorado's Front Range this summer, rip through communities. They torch homes. They disrupt lives. But wildfires also cause some surprising, maybe even uplifting things to happen. They strengthen the bonds between neighbors. They make people more resilient. And those stronger connections help people prepare for future emergencies. My guest today studies how communities come together during and after natural disasters. Lori Peake is a sociologist and the director of the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. And Lori explained that there's a surprisingly robust field of study that looks at how humans interact during and after a crisis. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, soon after World War II had ended, our United States government, and in particular the military, became very interested in how human beings would respond to crises. And so they funded these early field research teams to go out to study disasters, unexpected events, things like train derailments, tornadoes, earthquakes, and other crisis situations that disrupt entire communities Mm -hmm. because they wanted to understand how do people respond. So they assumed that people might panic, loot, riot, descend into social chaos. What researchers found time and time again was that people actually were so eager to help in the aftermath of disaster. And uh, many of these studies, as well as other studies that have been done in this area, have shown that common thread of people rising up, coming together, trying to help their neighbors. We saw that in the Marshall Fire with people going door to door, knocking, trying to alert their neighbors. And so there is this accumulated body of knowledge that really shows disasters do bring destruction and devastation and sometimes death, but they also bring people together. Colorado has certainly seen its share of major wildfires in the last few years. This summer, we've seen a number of them. That gives you kind of a front row seat to observing what's happening beyond the firefighting and the official response. What stands out to you? What did you see? Yes, so I live right near Left Hand Canyon here in Boulder County. And when the Stone Canyon fire broke out, some of the things that I saw most immediately were in my own community. Mm. When the fires ignited, our community email list lit up. (laughs) People started first communicating about they were seeing smoke and they wanted to know where the fires. And so people started responding with, here's an app I'm using. Here's where you can get reliable, credible information, which is a big concern in this day and age. And so first it was like information sharing. But once people started to understand the scale and the magnitude of the fires, what we started to see right here in our own neighborhood is people stepping up, sharing their evacuation go list helping to figure out um, how they could contribute to the emergency response. And also a member of my community set up a list where if people were willing to take in firefighters or evacuees from Lyons, for example, since we're only about seven, eight miles from Lyons, we had a list that was up and going within a day of the start of the fire. you have touched on some of the short-term ways communities come together during and immediately after a fire. What are some of the longer-term positives that you see? Oh, I'd love to refer to some research that I conducted after Hurricane Katrina and during and after the COVID-19 pandemic with my graduate students, where we actually were trying to track and understand children's altruistic behaviors in response to those disasters. And so we found, Mm -hmm. for example, that children did many things. They raised tens of thousands of dollars. They collected supplies. They helped to clean out homes. And so again, there are all these examples that get adults engaged in as well as children where they're helping during and a lot of times in the long-term aftermath of disaster. I bet many of your listeners on this program have done things like not only during a disaster, maybe donated supplies like we know in Lyons, community members donated towels and soap and things like that for the firefighters. We also see after the 2013 Colorado floods, 
People came in for years after those floods and were helping people to muck out their homes, to mitigate future flood disasters. And so we see those kind of long-term actions from community members as well. Research has actually shown when people have the opportunity to help in a disaster, especially when they're fellow survivors, that this can actually help with their own mental health and emotional recovery after the disaster. And is this something government leaders could tap into to help their community better prepare for the next disaster? Oh, absolutely. And one of my favorite examples, after the 2011 Christchurch earthquake, I actually had the opportunity to travel there and to learn about some of the response to that earthquake. And there was this amazing group that sprung up called the Student Volunteer Army. And it was literally hundreds of mostly college age students who came together. They did things like cleared away rubble and debris from the earthquake. They helped get food to elderly neighbors. They did all kinds of things. And they wanted to be more formally recognized in emergency management, but the emergency management system, it was sort of like, well, you have to sign up, you have to do this training. And so the students Mm. who were like, Let's make an app for that. (laughs) The students work together with emergency management so they could be formally and more rapidly recognized as spontaneous volunteers and become a part of the response. And so I love that example because it really shows that sometimes for good reason, we aren't able to accept outside volunteers into our formal emergency management apparatus. But with a little bit of imagination, a little bit of coordination, and a lot of (laughs) expertise on both sides, they figured out how to make that work and were able to tap into the energy and expertise of all those young people. And so some of the most effective emergency management agencies in our country, they've recognized that and they've figured out how to integrate those volunteers into the response in a in a responsible and effective way. Just to wrap up, are communities in Colorado getting better at bouncing back after a wildfire? I think here in Colorado, we are learning from fire. Even in the seven years that I've lived in this community, which is in the wildland urban interface, I've witnessed right here at home how people have sort of gone from There's smoke in the sky. What do we do to immediately springing into action and figuring out how can I help? And so I do feel like there is this learning from fire as there are more and more fires. But I also think it's a complicated question because we also know from research that in some ways people are like gas tanks, that the more and more that they get hit, by disaster, it depletes our gas tank, our personal gas tank, our community's gas tank, our emergency management funds to fight these fires and to respond from them. This is a very, very difficult challenge that we face, and we're only going to be able to face it together and with these sorts of creative solutions that are coming out of communities like here in Boulder, in Lyons, and Fort Collins, and well beyond. Lori Peak, thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank you, Erin. It has been a real honor and a pleasure. And that's it for us today on In the NoCo. I'm Erin O'Toole. Thanks so much for listening.